it's it's great to be with you all tonight and we're going to talk a little bit about pastures today and um i think we all have designs on having beautiful looking and and functioning pastures and um sometimes before we can get to this end result we have to sort of um tackle some of of the beginning and one of my one of my mentors when i was at when i was at purdue was fond of, of reminding us the importance of planting with any crop but but particularly with a perennial forage that the sins of planting will haunt you all season in the case of a of a pasture any mistake that we make during during the uh, stand establishment phase is going to haunt us for years and years and years to come. So our hope is that we can we can do this right. So these are some of the keys to to getting a good stand of of a perennial forage. And we're going to spend a little time on on each of these, but but quickly uh, control weed before seeding, having good soil fertility, prepare your seed bed properly. Uh, correct seeding time, depth of planting is important. Talk a little bit about equipment, and then we'll talk about how to manage that new seeding. So first, controlling weeds prior to seeding. Um, a great way to have a failure is to uh, fail to control the weeds before you plant your uh, new new stand of of uh, grass in a, in a pasture. So when we when we fail to control the the um, control weeds, it, it causes competition. The 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 slow growing and and weak perennial seedling will die. You end up with a thin or failed stand, and then you have to replant. Um, weeds, on the other hand, are not slow to establish. They will they will get going very quickly. And, uh, and and this is particularly true of perennial weeds. So when we have something that's that's um, that's coming back year year after year from roots, we can count on the fact that it's going to explode out of the ground as soon as you you plant your 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 new seed, and it's going to do its darndest to help to uh, thwart your your plans of getting a good stand. The annual weeds, on the other hand, you can count on them to to to, to be there year after year. They're going to come, and 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 there, it's important to try to figure out how to how to manipulate your planting date to maybe minimize that impact. Sometimes with <clears throat> with weeds, we have to begin to control them two years prior to seeding. So this can be a long term process, especially with certain chemicals that have long residuals in the soil. They um, uh, can take a while to dissipate to the point that that you can actually plant something. So so you may need to get on that early, and if you have a thin stand, you will have to reseed. And if you don't reseed, it'll never produce it at its, at its full potential. And so either way, you've got a you've got a problem that's going to cost you money. So you're best off to do it right the first time. So um, this is an example of a weed that, that causes lots of problems. This is um, still bindweed or a lot of a lot of folks call it morning glory, but it's a creeping perennial plant, very aggressive, very difficult to control. And um, if you try to plant into a, a piece of ground like this that where that weed has not been con controlled, it's it's going to be a problem. Soil fertility. Um, so just a, a real quick couple of things about about fertility at planting. It's a it's a good idea to minimize the um, nitrogen applied at uh, planting. So typically you'd want to stick with at most maybe 40 pounds per acre when you're seeding a, a, a pure grass because really all nitrogen does at this stage is stimulate weeds. So <clears throat> lay off of that and if you're if you're seeding a legume with your grass absolutely do not apply any nitrogen with that legume. It'll simply interfere with, with nodulation and, and those little rhizobium that are trying to get established. However, it is a great idea at planting to apply phosphorus. It's important for the vigor of the seedlings, uh, both grasses and legumes. Um, it's, it's used for uh, root growth 
and um, you'll you'll base this on your soil test, and it's a good idea to try to get that incorporated prior to seeding. When it comes to seedbed preparation, it's important to remember that fluffy soil is the enemy. Anytime we have fluffy soil, we have air pockets. The and and that air <clears throat> prevents good seed to soil contact to where the uh, water can be transferred from the from the from the from the soil into the seed so that the seed can germinate. And um, <clears throat> and basically that seed has to has to soak up about almost its whole almost its weight in water in order to trigger germination. So it's got to imbibe quite a bit of water. Um, also, if we have fluffy soil, the roots don't anchor well, um, the roots don't absorb adequate moisture, and then finally the plant will die. <clears throat> so good contact with the soil is a must. Um, it's a good idea to go over your drill, make sure that, that, that it's working properly. Um, also a great idea to have press wheels and drag chains or something that maybe roll the field after you plant to, in order to kind of compress that, that uh, seed and, and connect the seed with the soil to, to get good germination. This is just some example of some of the, some of the, the methods used to, to prepare a seed bed. So you might go through a, some sort of a, a brilliant or some sort of a cultipacker. Um, sometimes just dragging it with a harrow will be enough to help to compact it, but you're just trying to get a, a situation where you've got a good uh, compact seed bed that, that you can plant these small seeds into. And this leads us to a rule of thumb for planting, and this is called the rule of boot. And the rule of boot is that if you're, if you're wearing your standard issue cowboy boots out on the, out on the farmer ranch, you should be able to go to your seed bed that you're planning to plant into and take your boot that has a, a heel and a sole and an arch and step into the, into the area that you plan to, to, to plant in with all your weight and then step off of it and take a look at the, at the aftermath. If you can see the imprint of your um, heel and your sole, um, but also an impression of your arch, that means that that seedbed is too fluffy to plant and we need to do some further operations in order to compact it more. But if you step into it and you don't see the arch, then you know that the seedbed is in great shape, go ahead and plant it and you should get an excellent stand. Um, <clears throat> when in doubt, more firm is better because anytime that you're doing this, you'll always, you'll you'll often get to the point where you'll be like, oh, I don't know if this is if this is good enough. If I should hit it one more time, um, if 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 there's any doubt in your mind that it's not good enough, that it's too fluffy, go ahead and and do another operation. Try to try to compact it a little bit better. So here is an example of of two seed beds <clears throat> that I want you to take a look at, and. <clears throat> So the one on the top, you can see, has a little bit of, has some clods, and um, the the one below it doesn't. And you can see a little bit about the soil, the, the soil textures, and and uh, just think for just a second about what it, are are these uh, good seed beds? Are they fair, poor, perfect? Um, does it depend? Um, <clears throat> And since we can't really have any audience participation here, we'll just go through it. But um, you'll notice that this top one has some small, small clods. Um, they're not they're not huge clods, but they're 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 smaller. There's a lot of finer uh, soil particles here that you could drop seed into, get good seed to soil contact, and 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 um, uh, be be in luck. So really, this is a this is a pretty good um, seed bed. Now the lower picture, you can tell that that's been pulverized. <clears throat> This may be a good seed bed if it's a if it's a sandier soil. It looks like it, it looks like it may be a, a lighter textured soil, um, and so if it's sandy, it, it uh, may be okay. But if this has any type of, of uh, silt or clay in it, it 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 could crust really bad when you get water to it and prevent things from coming up through. So. <clears throat> Clods, just because a, a soil is cloddy, that's not always a problem, but if there are clods, the clods must be small. Um, that's because the seeds can work into the crevices and, and it's almost like that old game on that, I uh, can't remember what that game show was, but where they played Plinko and, and you drop the seed in and it'll just kind of clank around and, and end up 
four or five inches deep if you if you have a bed of clods. So, um, but but powdery soils can can really be a problem, and and the fact that we have to often work the soil enough to get a good seed bed to plant these things, we we can encounter powdery seed beds when we're trying to plant perennial forages. Seeding depth. <clears throat> so we see more failures in planting perennial forages from planting too deep than anything else. And these are, you're typically dealing with small seeds and because of that, they need to be planted shallowly. So the, the rule of thumb is that we wanna plant two and a half to five times the width of the seed in, in, in depth, deep into the soil. And that gets it uh, hopefully into some moisture, but um, shallow enough that the seed can get through the ground before the before crusting occurs or before um, it runs out of energy. So we we base our seeding depth on on moisture, uh, soil texture, temperature, time of year. A lot of times the, your experience with a particular piece of ground comes into play. And, and we use all of that to kind of adjust our seeding, our seeding depth. Here I have a little bit of a table that, that shows some of the, like when we, how, how soil texture can affect how deep we plant. So if you have a small seed on, on, a, on a fine textured soil, like a sandier soil, you might plant a quarter to a half an inch. Um, sorry, in a fine soil, you would do that in a, in a clay type soil, but in a sandy or more coarse soil, you might go half an inch to an inch. So you go a little bit deeper um, in the, the more coarse soil. In with large seed, you may be a quarter to, to three quarters of an inch in a fine soil, but maybe maybe kick that up to, to three quarters to an inch and a half on, on a sandier soil. So um, anytime I'm working with somebody and they, they ask a question about what, whether I should um, you're faced with the decision to go in too deep or too shallow, I will always recommend going too shallow because we can overcome too, too shallow, but we can't overcome too deep. If it's too shallow, we can just irrigate it continuously and you can, and you can actually get it to germinate and take hold. But if it's too deep, the, the, that poor little seed runs out of energy. The seedling runs out of energy before it can get to the surface and it's going to die. So um, that's just another one of those rules of thumb. There, there's interest in, in uh, using companion crops in, in planting pastures, and that's just because we can, we, can, we can maybe get a little bit more feed and get a jump start on things. And that's, and that, that's possible. There's ways to manage to, to help to make that successful. Um, but remember that you are planting a weed with your perennial um, forage plant. You're, you're planting something that you want to be harvesting for the next five or 10 or 20 years. And, and you can do things with these, um, these companion crops that, that uh, may cause your stand to thin just a little bit and, um, and, and be something that's going to reduce your yields over the life of your stand. I think it, it can be a really good idea to think about planting no-till into the stubble of a previous crop and, and treating that almost like a companion crop. It, it really, it serves the same purpose. It covers the soil, helps uh, shade, the, shade the ground just a little bit um, and gives the, the, the establishing seedlings a little bit of protection, but it's not actively growing where it's going to be competing with, with, with your, your establishing seedlings and, and, and it'll help you get a good stand. Plus, it's almost impossible to plant too deep when you plant into, in, into a situation with, with the stubble like this because the ground is gonna be a little bit harder. Um, it's already has gone through a little bit of time where the, where the soil is compacted a little bit. And so you'll, you'll avoid planting too deep. Planting date, when possible, it's, it's usually recommended to, to, to seed in, in late summer or early fall. So August or early September. In order to do that, you need to have irrigation water available at that time. <clears throat> and um, because we typically don't get reliable rainfall in, in uh, August and early September. So the reason this works well is because temperatures favor rapid germination, emergence, and, and development. The weed pressure is going to be lighter because the summer annual weeds won't want to grow at that, that, that uh, late juncture of the season. 
And so that can be a real positive, uh, but we need to have six to eight weeks of time available for growth prior to the first hard freeze in order for this to work. And um, so wherever you are in, wh wherever your, your, your farming operation is, just do some back calculation of when you expect that first hard frost and make sure you hit that uh, deadline. The, you can expect excellent grass establishment by doing this, but legumes need to be established a little bit earlier than the grasses do in order to ensure enough growth going into winter. So the grasses can be a little bit more forgiving if you if you bump up against the, the, the deadline for when you need to have the seed in the ground. Legumes are not, they'll just die. Oops. There's a lot of tight, a lot of cedars out there and really about, about anything will work. Just make sure it's in good repair and uh, make sure that you do something to press that seed into the soil. Okay, so let's say that you have an existing pasture, and but, but you want to try to make things better. So you're faced with a couple of decisions. One is you could go and hose the pasture down with Roundup and plow and start over again, but um, it's probably not the that there's there's a there's a better there's a better choice here and that would be to try to figure out how to improve the stand that you have. <laughs> so this is called interseeding, it's called sod seeding, it's called overseeding or frost seeding or a lot of other things. But the advantage of 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 trying to sweeten an old stand as opposed to clear seeding, which is basically starting with a clean slate and planting into a tilled seed bed, is generally this is more cost effective. You you can because you're not starting over. You're just kind of improving what you already have. You minimize erosion because the existing vegetation serves as your cover crop, and there's less downtime and loss of productivity uh, because you're you're sort of keeping what you already have and, and making it a little bit better. The disadvantage, the risk of failure is higher by by doing this. It's it's definitely more difficult to do than just starting over. The, the um, sometimes it's difficult for people to find a drill that's capable of interseeding. And so that could be a, a real limitation. And finally, it can, it can often take two or three years before these interseeded plants can achieve full productivity and actually start contributing to, to your yields. So the keys to making interseeding work, um, we need to be able to see some bare soil in order to, to, to make this go. Remember, these plants are competing for space. You see an example of that over here on the right. We need to do something to suppress existing vegetation, and we can do that either with chemicals, through grazing or mowing, or, or some sort of mechanical method. You want to plant in mid to late summer. You, you typically want to avoid the early part of the year, the, the cool season when these, when these cool season grasses and, and even the legumes tend to do really well because we wanna give these new plants a shot. Um, be careful with fertilizer. Again, you wanna avoid nitrogen because we don't wanna do things to, to, to really help out the existing plants because we wanna get the new things established. Phosphorus, if you wanna apply that, you might wanna to try to band it so it's, it's directly below the seed to, to give the advantage to the new seedling instead of the existing stand. And then you wanna manage this, the, the stand to favor the seedlings. So think about irrigation. You want to irrigate for a brand new seedling and not for those big old established plants. You also want to go in and either hay it or lightly graze it earlier than normal in order to, to uh, trim back that overstory a little bit and keep the canopy open so the new plants can establish. So to illustrate this, I wanted to show you an interseeding study we did a few years ago where we had six plantings at three locations in Utah. So we, we looked at at doing a, a, a close mowing. So we basically scout the soil, just like if you were grazing heavily. We did, we applied Roundup at a really low rate, six ounces enough to maybe make the, the, the perennial grasses sick, but not kill them. And we also looked at a light tillage, just going in and just kind of moving, uh, roughing up some plants a little bit and creating a little, little uh, bare soil, but not hurt, hurting the stand too much. We then went in and planted three different legumes, either alfalfa, bird's foot trefoil, or sice or milk fetch. And so the, the yellow flowered plant here is bird's foot trefoil. It's a non-bloating legume that uh, works really good in pastures, especially in this environment. 
and there's Sicer milk vetch. That is also a non-bloating legume, uh, but it's a little bit slower to establish and um, yeah, does better with, with less moisture. So this is a, this is a picture of, of a plot establishment in Panguitch, and you can see that we had a, a very, very dense stand of, of grass at that location. And this is kind of what we were seeding in too. So definitely needed to, uh, to do something to set that, that uh, stand back a little bit. And it, I'll skip all the, all the data. We had mounds and mounds of it, but what I wanted to get to were the take home messages. And what I'll tell you is this, number one, all attempts in spring and fall were failures. Anything we tried to do in those, those extremes of the year didn't work. But every time we tried to do it in the summer, during the hot part of the year, it worked every time. And, and that's because you get into the warm season, those grasses, those, they're, they're cool season grasses, they don't tend to grow as well. And it gives you a chance of getting one of these little legumes established and get them, get, getting them going. All treatments, all those treatments that we looked at, whether it was herbicides, grazing, or, um, or just roughing up the stand with some tillage equipment, everything worked equally as long as you did something to, to set back the existing stand. Uh, they all did the job. So that's kind of what, that's kind of what we learned. And um, looks like my time's out. So I'm going to go ahead and skip to the end and tell you all thank you very much and um, happy seating. <laughs>